it's a very special weekend at 242. Um, let me introduce myself first. My name is Brad. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. And uh, this is our back to school weekend. Uh, last year we started this, and this is probably going to be something we're going to do kind of regularly, but, but we really feel like the children that are in our church, this next generation of, of Christ followers that, you know, are, that we're raising up and building into as a congregation, um, many of them are starting school tomorrow or this week or next week. And, and so we as a church, as a congregation, we want to encourage them and we want to be a blessing to them and we want to equip them for the mission field that they're going into, which is their local church. And the same for everyone who works in the church and uh, school environment, I'm sorry. And so that's what this weekend is kind of about. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, here. But I assure you, uh, there's going to be something this weekend for everyone. Because you may be sitting here like, well, I don't have you know, small children in school or I don't have any children at all. And if that's you, that's fine. Because here's the thing, you're still part of our family. You know, and these children are still your children because they're, they're, they're 242's children. And so all of this applies to each and every one of us. And, and this is what we want to do. Because, because here's the thing. As a staff, we care deeply about what's happening in the schools in our communities. Uh, our staff is made up of several uh, parents. We have, you know, parents who, you know, on our staff who homeschool their children. We have parents on our staff uh, who private, center schools, private schools. My children are in, in public schools. Um, this past uh, fall, it was one of the cutest things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, one of our staff people uh, had just started homeschooling their children. Like this was their first time doing it and they were going to get the process together and everything. And so I, it was, you know, it was, you know the, the husband was, you know, not there. It was the wife who was leading the class. And, and so she's going to lead her children in school. And so they got the kids together, the three daughters, and we're going to start the school day. And so she's like, girls, let's pray. And we're going to start our first day at homeschool. And so they pray. <laughs> As soon as they get done without missing the beat, the middle daughter goes, wait a minute, is this a Christian homeschool? <laughs> Which I thought was awesome. That's like, it's like so great. It's like, nah, it's just a Christian home. So yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, so funny, but like, but here's the thing, you know, like, but, but for those students, you know, who also, who, who go to public school, private schools, like, we also want to be praying over them as well. We believe at 242, praying for our, our, you know, people who work in schools, praying for our children who are in schools. We believe that's going to have power uh, for the kingdom of God. And so today we, we want to commission our students. We're going to do that at the end of the service. Uh, but for my time today, what I want to do is I want to just go through a chapter of the Bible together and maybe hopefully encourage you and maybe in, in the way that you, you and I can live out our faith in our community for God's glory. Um, so here's the deal. If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, open it up to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4, that's where we're going to be. We're going to get there in just a second. But just so you know why you're turning there, what's going on in, in, as far as history is concerned, um, the book of Acts is a very important book of the Bible for us. I mean, that's the book where we get our namesake from, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, because that's the first mention of the church in the New Testament. And, and in Acts chapter 4 in particular, what you're going to see is Jesus' uh, followers, Peter and John namely, are, 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 they're out doing ministry. They're out walking and they're, they're doing uh, they're, you know, uh, healings. They're preaching about Jesus and the gospel. It says when Peter preached, it said thousands of people became saved. Like the, from, from day one, the church was thousands of people uh, large, and, and then it only kept growing from there. And so they're doing all this preaching and teaching, and they're doing these miracles, and what you see in Acts chapter 4 is they heal a, a person. And it's interesting, the Bible tells us you know, that, that this, this person stands out because uh, this person was older than the usual person who was healed. There's, in fact, I mean, I don't think, I mean, the Bible says it was an older person. He was 40. <laughs> so, yeah, basically he's like one foot in the grave, okay? Yeah. And John and Peter heal him. Now, here's the problem. Because the guy was 40 and everybody knew him. Everybody knew his ailment. Everybody knew that what was going on in his life. And so when he gets healed, it's starting this, this upheaval in the community. So this elite group of people called the Sanhedrin, which, which when you hear the word Sanhedrin, think Supreme Court, because that's kind of what they are. They, they, they are the, 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 the most educated, the, most, uh, the, the people who have the most knowledge of scripture. Uh, they're the people who are uh, looking at these, you know, who are holding all these cases and stuff like that. So they bring Peter and John in front of them and they threaten them and they tell them, you stop talking about Jesus. You stop doing miracles. You need to stop this movement that is happening in our community. 
And when you get to the second half of Acts chapter four, it's the response of Peter and John specifically that stands out to me. And it's the response of Peter and John that I think applies not only to us in this room right now, but it's gonna apply to these children that you're gonna see on the stage in a moment. So I just wanna read through this section together. Hopefully you'll read along with me. If you have your Bible or Bible app, Acts chapter four, we'll pick it up in verse 21. And uh, there's some cool things to highlight in the note here. So let's read this together. So basically, Peter and John have been uh, released, and this is what it says. After further threats, they let him go. The, The Sanhedrin people let Peter and John go. They could not decide how to punish them because of all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On the release, look what it says. Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. That's the Sanhedrin. It goes on and says, and when they heard this, the people, they raised their voices together and they prayed to God. I love that. Here's Peter and John with very real opposition, very real, you know, whatever. And, and, and it says that they prayed to God. If they start off this prayer by just praising God, God, you're sovereign. God, you're in control. God, you are great. Nothing happens without you knowing it, God. And then they go on. If you can look in your Bible, the next couple of verses you see, specifically they're, they're praying and about how great God is, how powerful God is, how in control of the situation that God is. And then look what they say. If you bounce down to verse 37, it says this, indeed. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will has decided beforehand should happen. But look what it says, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And it goes on, it says, and to stretch out your hand and to heal them, perform signs and wonders through the, uh, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. But I love that scene. Here's Peter and John who are just ordinary people. They're ordinary people void of the fact that they've been with Jesus for three years. For three years, they've been walking with Jesus. For three years, they've been listening to Jesus. For three years, they've been watching Jesus do miracles. And, and, and now that experience, that time with Jesus has changed them to the point where even though they're uneducated, even though they're not of nobility, even though they're not of a high-ranking position in the community or or class or anything, here they are standing in front of essentially the highest court in that community, and they're not afraid. And they hear threats, but they they say, but we can't stop. And when they go back to, to the church and they go back to the people, they start to pray, and they pray a prayer of boldness. If you had your Bible open, that's a a verse to underline. That's a verse to keep track of. Look at verse uh, verse 29. Now, Lord, consider your servant's threat and enable your servants to speak with great boldness. That's what I want for the church. That's my desire, that we'd be a new church like the first church, that we would be a church that we filled with men and women who would grow in their faith to the point where when push comes to shove, they have boldness in their walk with God because that's when the church is effective. In fact, it's interesting that it was Peter and John, the the two that were arrested. It's interesting because those are probably, you know, the two most fitting and also the two most terrified people to be arrested in the church. I mean, Peter and John were some of the highest ranking church leaders at that time. They're they're two of the 12. John and Peter were with Jesus at the transfiguration. So so these are people who who are really important to the church. So the church had to be freaking out. We might lose Peter and John. But I love it. For Peter and John, they're not afraid. And it says that they prayed with boldness. Now, my question is, why were they so bold? Like, what did, what did they experience? What did they do? I mean, if we back up and you read it, why were they so bold? And, and, and the only thing I can see is this. If you look at just the Gospels in general, the entirety of the Gospels, the reason they are so bold It's because they've seen Jesus. And in seeing Jesus, I mean, they've seen God work in this land. And I'm telling you, it just takes a few of those moments for your faith to become a foundation that becomes unshakable. Here's what I don't want. I don't want hundreds of people to literally sit in thousands of church services 
and just see a church service. The hope of the world is not in people seeing church services. The hope in the world is more individuals seeing Jesus work in their lives. And, and, and when you come here and we sing these songs and we worship, we come here and we, and we pray, and when you come here and we teach and, 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 and train, hopefully you're taking this encouragement and the, the Spirit of God and you're taking this knowledge and you're going out and implementing it in your life because it's when you use it, that's when God shows up. And for Peter and John, you know, they were with Jesus for three years, but now school is out. They are on their own. They're in Jerusalem, they're walking through the city, and they're doing what Jesus told them to do, but they're being threatened and told to stop. And so they're just saying, here's the deal. We have to serve Jesus. And with boldness, they kept going forward with that. And I was like, man, that's what I want. I want a church that sees Jesus, knows Jesus, and with boldness goes into this, our community, and loves people and leads people back to that Jesus they met. Because for Peter and John, knowing Jesus changed everything. Uh, I, love the, I love this encounter that they had with Jesus in, in John chapter 20. We'll put it on the screen for you. In John 20, this is right after uh, the resurrection. Jesus went to the cross. He was dead for three days. He comes back from the death. He appears in his bodily form in front of his disciples. And I love what he says. In fact, when you first read it, it's kind of weird. It says this, and Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And I love this next verse. And with that, he breathed on them. It's just a, it's an odd thing for Jesus to do, right? Jesus would be like, unless in my mind, I was like, oh, well, maybe like he came back from the dead. So he's like, he told me, I am sending you, but real fast before you go, is it bad? I was dead three days. Is it, do I need a mint? Like that's what, that's what I thought they were going. But look what it says when you read all of it. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is so beautiful and so profound. Because when you go back to the very beginning of the Bible, you go back to the book of Genesis, it says that God himself took clay from this earth and he took soil from this earth and it says it was God himself who breathed life into it and made mankind. And here's Jesus in front of his disciples and it says he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit of God. And what's interesting is in the Greek, the word that we use for spirit is the, and the word for breath or wind is then the exact same word, pneuma. So John and Peter, they're, they're not afraid of the opposition and they're not afraid of the challenge. And the reason that they can pray with boldness is because they've seen God work, they received his spirit, and they know that the calling that they have on their life for the kingdom of God is gonna outweigh anything else. And so out of the overflow of that boldness, they begin to act. And what you see is God sees that faith and shows up and starts to use it. And it happens in that order too. That's what's interesting to me. When you go back and look at it, you see it. It's, it's, it's like their prayers, they're like, it, it's like their prayers pleased God. And, and, and if you look at verse 31, in fact, it's, it's not on the screen, but if you look in your Bible there, it says this, it says, after they prayed, isn't that interesting? After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. But it says, after they prayed. I believe that's how God works. I mean, I think God's looking for people to use. I believe God's looking for people to equip. In fact, I mean, that's what the Bible tells us consistently, even from the Old Testament. In, in, in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 16, it says this, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. It means God is going through this world and he's looking for someone to bless. He's looking for a faith. He's looking for someone who's ready to be used by him. And, and for the disciples, I love it. They were arrested, but it's, that's not when the room was shaken. They were standing in front of the Sanhedrin, but that's not when the room was shaken. They were questioned and threatened, but that's not when the room was shaken. It says after they prayed, that's when God started to show up. And so I think that's where we have to be as a church. Individually, we have to get to a point in our faith where we are going to incorporate God into everything. And knowing that it's, it's after we pray oftentimes that God starts to move in our lives. And so 
what you see them is, is these three things. And, and, and so you see that these prayer please God. The, the, the second thing I see in this scenario is this, is that the prayer ushered in the presence of God. The prayer ushered in the presence of God into that community, into that setting, into that scenario. In fact, I love the way the psalmist puts it in Psalm 84. It says this at the very beginning. It says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns and even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. I don't know how much you value the presence of God, but as a church, that should be something that we're constantly growing in, not just, even, not just for us to experience the presence ourselves, but for us to be instruments of taking that presence of God to other people. That's where Surfest started. You know, this past Saturday, you heard Kelly up here earlier talking about us as a church going out and serving in the community. If you've never done that, I'm, I'm telling you, you're missing a huge part of what, who the church is and what the church does. And in particular, this past Saturday, I was up in uh, Saginaw. I went to our Saginaw campus, and uh, we were looking at a school up there. We were painting some classrooms and blessing some teachers. And uh, before we got started, we were having you know, a little huddle, and we were praying and saying we're getting ready to you know, go do this thing. And, and I remember we were sitting there praying, and, and at the corner of my eye, I just noticed that a couple of the people with us were younger, like in high school. Like there was two high school boys who were there to serve with us. Now, it's 9 o'clock on Saturday morning at a school. And there's two high school boys who woke up and came here on their own. I, I thought Jesus returned. I'm like, where is, is he here? Is it, I missed something? But they were ready to, to serve. Now, here's what's interesting. Now, that, that alone stood out to me. I took notice of that. But here's what stood out even more. Because of that, I wanted to get to know them. I wanted to hear a little bit of their story. Why are they doing this? And what stood out to me is they don't even go to that school. They don't even go to that school system. In fact, they go to a rival school across town. but they love Jesus so much and they want to share Jesus' love with more and more people so much that they woke up on their own on a Saturday morning and went to a hostile environment to be a blessing. For them, as, as high school students, they said, it's more important for me to wake up and, and bring the presence of Jesus to these teachers than to run up a score in a football game. How awesome is that? How powerful is that? That, 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 that they and their youth have, have, have learned this. And what I'm looking at is like all of our high school students who meet here on Sunday nights. I'm thinking about all of our junior high students who meet here on Friday nights. I'm thinking about our fifth and sixth grade students who are worshiping right now. I'm thinking about our elementary students. I'm just thinking about the potential for these young men and women to show God's love in an environment where you're never gonna be around such an eclectic group of people almost ever again for the rest of your life. And so those two boys, when they, they stepped up and they did that, I just, man, something just stood out to me. I'm like, they are really ushering in the presence of God. Are we doing that? Are we doing that in our workspaces? Are we doing that in our homes? Are we doing that in our lives? Are we praying for people who are far from God? And are we serving them? For these two students, these two students, they did that, and it was powerful. And I love the way James puts it. If you go to the book of James, James chapter four, verse eight, he says these words, and it's so encouraging to me because it says this, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, it seems like that ends on a negative note, right? But I love it that even just in that, that God's honest. He knows that we can be double-minded. He knows that we have the the potential, that, not that anybody would, but we have the potential to actually sit in a church service and hear about Jesus and then leave as if nothing changed in our life. That's odd. God knows that we have that potential. But God's desire, even in this verse, is not to punish us for that. It's calling us to come to him to be delivered from it. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. It's exponential. As you take closer steps to him, he's taking closer steps to you. And that's what we want to do is help usher in who God is into our community. And then finally, what you see is you, you go on and, and you read down, you see that the, you know, the, 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 the prayer definitely pleased God. He shows up after they pray, they shakes it after they pray. You see God's power, or his presence show up. And the last thing is just that you see the power of God revealed to them, available to them after this prayer. 
And I don't understand if you, I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've been in scenarios where you're like, I don't want to speak up because I don't know what to say. Maybe you've been in scenarios where like, I don't want to speak up because it might be awkward. Maybe you've been in scenarios where you're like, I don't want to share my faith because I don't, I'm nothing special. Like, I mean, maybe this is the kind of these conversations that you have in your mind in different scenarios. For Peter and John, I guarantee you, just because they're human beings, they were having similar thoughts. But the Spirit of God emboldened them. The Spirit of God empowered them. And because of the Spirit and through the Spirit, man, they went through that community and changed everything. One of my favorite verses on, on, on the power of God, it's, it's in Psalms, in Psalms uh, eight, uh, 46, and I'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, uh, he says, talking about God, be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. And here's what I love about that. Those two words, be still. Be still and know that I'm God. Later on, it's gonna say, be still and know that the God fights for you, that God fights for you. Now, maybe you've heard that verse before, and I've heard, definitely heard that verse before, and when I think about that verse, I think about be still because your God fights for you. When I hear that verse, I think about just that imagery, that I don't have to you know, advance, I don't have to fight, I don't have to plead my case. Like, like I have a God who's going to fight for me and that's awesome, but, but here's something else I just wanna to reveal to you the truth of that scripture. Be still, be still. Yes, it means you don't have to fight, that there's a God who fights for you. But be still also means don't retreat. Stop running away. Stop running and hiding. Stop running in fear. Be still. Plant your feet where you are and shine for the Lord. Plant your feet where you are and shine for Jesus. Be still and believe that there's a God in the universe who hears you, who cares for you, and who will show up and protect you and fight for you. And I think too often we, we, we fear the awkward and, and so we, we back away when God's saying, no, 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 just be still, just be still. You, you don't even have to, advance. just be still and know that I'll be there with you. And I believe that's, that's the power, that the, the, the calling that God wants of us, the power that he wants us to show in our world. It's, it's not just, you know, you, know, you know, arguing with people. It's not about debating people. It's about showing people that God is real to us. It's about showing people that God really moves in this world and it's about showing people that this is the most important thing that we do. In fact, I love the way that Paul says this to Timothy when, when Paul was, was releasing his apprentice, Timothy, to, to start the church or to run the church in Ephesus. Uh, Paul reminds him, he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. He gave us power, love, and self-discipline. And maybe... Maybe you're just thinking to yourself, I don't even know what to pray. I wouldn't even know what to pray. If I were praying for my children, I wouldn't even know what to pray for them. If I was praying for myself, I wouldn't even know. Well, those are three great things. Power, love, self-discipline. What would it look like for you at work if you were power, love, and self-discipline? What would it look like for your household if you valued power, love, self-discipline? What could it look like in our schools if, if, if our children were instruments of power, love, and self-discipline? That's the type of prayer we should be praying over our students, that they would go and lead people to Christ. In fact, let me say this. Um, in just a moment, we're gonna invite you know, our kids to come up here on stage, our elementary kids, and, and we're gonna commission them, and we're gonna pray over them and pray over uh, them going back to school. But, but I, I do, I feel like I need to say this, because like, when I say we're gonna pray over our children, maybe your mind is going at a place where maybe a lot of parents' minds tend to go. Safety right? In this day and age, particularly in our climate and our culture, schools seem like less and less safe places. And as parents, and as we're sending our children into those environments, uh, I mean, believe me, I'm right there with you that sometimes you, you start to feel like, you know, like, oh, are they going to be okay? Are they going to get their lunch open, you know? And then as they get older, are they going to get bullied? Are they going to have friends? Are people going to like them? Like, these are huge concerns we have as parents, and I, and I am right there with you. But here's what I would say for us as a church. I don't wanna just pray for our kids' safety. Absolutely, I want our children to be saved. Absolutely, and we should be praying for that, and that should be our desire. But that's not our end goal. And this may sound counterintuitive, but I, 
I don't ultimately, I'm not concerned that all of our children are, are learning everything. You know, like I'm, I'm not praying, Lord, help them pass all their tests and get A's because you can get C's, you'll be fine. Anyway, and um, <laughs> no, get, get good grades, it's easier for you. Okay, um, but I think when we say we're gonna pray for our kids in school, our minds automatically go, we're gonna pray that they learn, we're gonna pray that they have friends, and we're gonna pray that they're safe. And I'm telling you, particularly when you read the book of Acts and you see what the church started to do, you're gonna notice friendship wasn't the number one goal. Learning isn't the number one goal. And even safety is not the number one goal. Peter and John are gonna get dismissed from the Sanhedrin. They're gonna live and go on to do ministry. In three short chapters, another follower of Jesus named Stephen is gonna stand in front of that exact same court and he's gonna be executed for his faith. The first person in the Bible to be killed for their belief. And when you read Stephen's account, you see the same thing you saw in John and Peter and you see the same things that we see all throughout the book of Acts. Boldness in love with power and self-discipline. He presents the gospel to the Sanhedrin before his death and he dies. And when you go forward a little bit more, what you're gonna see is his sacrifice is really the starting off point for the apostle Paul coming to faith. And, and so what you see is you see to see God at work in all of this. And so here's what I want us to do. As we kind of close up our service today, two things. One, I want you to be thinking about where are you going? Not ultimately, I mean literally tomorrow, where are you going? Some of you are going to work, some of you are going to be dropping your children off of school, some of you may be running errands. I don't know where you're going tomorrow, but here's what I do know. Wherever you're going tomorrow, God can use you. The question is whether or not you're gonna ask him to. And so maybe ending this service, maybe for the first time, Maybe a good step for you is to pray for boldness, to pray for God to show up, to bring his power and to use you where you are. But also what I wanna do while we close out the service is, I know where our children are going. Tomorrow and next week, they're going back to school. And we know that that's an opportunity for them to shine for the kingdom of God. And absolutely, we want them to be safe. And absolutely, we want them to learn. But I want our children to be the church. And so we wanna also pray over them that they would go and they would shine with their teachers and with their classmates and they would be a blessing to people. So we're gonna invite our elementary students out on stage here in just a moment and we're gonna commission them and pray for them and, and lift them up. And so um, would you join me in, in, in that? And, and while we have them come on stage, understand that we're not just gonna be blessing our students, we wanna bless anyone who works at a school. I mean, particularly, I mean, we know teachers, you guys give so much to this generation and uh, we want you to know that what you do matters. And, uh, and you may not make a lot of money doing it, but it absolutely matters. In fact, it was interesting. We asked some teachers here at 242 what it was that they actually made. And uh, here's how they answered that question. Let's check this out. I make learning exciting. I make opportunities in which creativity can spark. I make finding X easy. I make kids sing and dance. I make students feel like they have a place to belong. I make quality individuals. I make kids pursue their questions. I make each day a fresh start. I make kids feel the rhythm. I make mathematics a pathway, not a roadblock. Make them believe in themselves. Uh, I make students try and try and try. I make students understand the value of persistence. I make school a great place to grow and learn. I make learning fun. I make a difference. I make a difference. <laughs>